I'm now going to pick up where I left off at the end of the last video and um, talk a bit about the basic properties of the discrete Fourier transform. Um, but there was, I had a sort of hunch while I was uh, recording that video, as I actually said, that there was something I was forgetting to say, and afterwards I remembered what it was. Uh, it doesn't matter too much because I can say it right now, um, which was that I didn't talk about what the discrete Fourier transform looks like um, in two particularly important cases of finite abelian groups. And those, those two particularly important cases, so the pen seems to have gone small again, um, they are cyclic groups, so G equals um, Zn, and I'll put, put a capital N because the other case is um, where G equals Fp to the little n, where Fp is a field with p elements. Um, so this, I, I wanted to, to, the size of the group, so to speak, to be capital N, and capital N will be P to the little n, so that's why I've used a different n for the two groups. Um, that's not a very important point, of course. Uh, sometimes it's we, we might also want to look at Fq to the n, where Q is a prime power, and uh, Fq is the field with Q elements, but... Uh, Usually we're happy with just a prime, and even just looking at p equals 3 often is, has all the interest of whatever the problem is I'm looking at. Sometimes p equals 2 even, although f2 has particular special properties that um, make it not always very typical. Uh, so let's just have a look at that then. So what is a character on Zn going to be like? Uh, it'll just be of the form if I take a if I take some u belonging to Zn, then uh, the character chi u that I defined before will send um, x to e of u x over n, and um, in the case of f p to the n. Chi u now u is now um, a vector in f p to the n, so it's u one up to u n, and it'll take x, which is also a vector in f p to the n, to e to the to, uh, e to the two pi i of u dot x over not n now but um, p, where u dot x is just shorthand for. Uh, the sum mod p of u i x i is a sort of mod p inner product of uh, u i uh, of u and x. So that's what the characters look like in those cases. Um, they're quite nice. I mean, that, that, those are just specializations of the formula I wrote down for a, an arbitrary finite or well, arbitrary product of cyclic groups. Uh, and so the Fourier transform then becomes. Uh, I like I typically write f hat of u rather than f hat of chi u. So I, I perform this identification of the dual group z n hat um, with z n, and so f hat of u equals the average over all x of f x um, e u x over n. And actually, I have a a, a bad habit a habit people don't terribly like. But I don't mind it. Um, I write this instead as uh, fx omega to the minus ux, where omega equals e to the 2 pi i over n. It's just sort of quicker to write than this, but it means exactly the same thing. And um, if it's really important to say which root of unity, I might write omega n or something, but usually I, I, I don't. Or another possible notation which I sometimes think of using is to write e n of u x instead of e of u x over n. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'll do that. And in the case of f p to the n it looks almost exactly the same but it means something slightly different. So f x. Uh, and actually I also prefer not to put these complex conjugates. Uh, I prefer to write something which is means exactly the same thing. Well, I've done it here with this minus, I'd write e of minus ux over n. Um, and then here it would be e of 
minus u dot x over p. Just substitute this character in for my inner product, uh, which again I could rewrite as ex fx omega to the minus u dot x, <coughs> where now omega is e to the 2 pi i over p, pth root of unity instead of an nth root of unity for the second formula. Okay, so one of the reasons for writing this down, particularly in this, well, in either of these forms, is that we can then just sort of see that it does actually look rather like the definition um, f hat of alpha equals integral of fx e to the minus 2 pi i alpha x. Very sort of normal. There's a lot of choice about how you define the Fourier transform here. So do you want 2 pi i there or just i? And do you want a factor outside here? And, and so on and so forth. But um, uh, that's not what I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get into what choice of normalization, a normalizing factor I want to use here or where this integral is defined and so on and so forth. It's just that you've seen that kind of formula um, or whether you have a, a plus here instead of a minus, that's another choice you can make. Um, and uh, so this is just, you can see that this is a little discrete version of what we've got here. So that's what were the properties that we wanted to think about? Well, there was the inversion formula here, and then there's the Plancherel or the Parseval's identity here. I'm going to start with Parseval's identity, then I'll give the inversion formula, and then I will move on to a third property, which is the one that distinguishes the Fourier transform just from just any old unitary map from one Hilbert space to another. So lemma. So we've basically seen why this is true already. Um, uh, I'll spare you all the setup. Let's just cut to the chase and say f hat g hat equals f g. So the setup would say, of course, let g be a finite abelian group. Let f and g be functions from g to c um, with Fourier transforms f hat. And then we have this. Um, by the way, in the printed notes, I do give all the setup quite carefully. So uh, anyway, so what's the proof? This is just a long bit of algebra. Um, but as I say, you can just, I've already sort of argued that it ought to be the case, just from thinking about the fact that the characters form an orthonormal basis. Uh, so by definition, but this helps, I think, to familiarize, ourselves, familiarize oneself with the definitions. So this is over on g hat, so we take a sum over all chi of f hat chi g hat chi bar, which equals the sum over all chi. Now let's, I've just expanded the inner product. Now I'll expand the definitions of the Fourier transform. So the first one is going to be average over x, f of x, chi of x bar. And then the second one will be average over y, g of y, chi of y bar, but there's a bar over there, so I better put a bar right over the top of all that. And um, I don't really need brackets here because uh, we have something called the distributive law, which shows that taking out the brackets doesn't make any difference here. Um, now what I'm going to do is take these, I'm going to, this is just a reflex action when you do um, these kinds of arguments, that uh, why not think about interchanging um, sum orders of summation? So these are summations up to a normalizing factor. So I'm going to bring out the x and the y. And the advantage of doing that is that I can, by distributivity, I can take out f of x and gy outside this sum here. So I've somehow gained something. And we'll see what we've gained in a moment. So we get average over all x, average over all y, f of x, g of y hat, uh, g of y bar, which is sort of promising because we're trying to get um, an f and a g bar. So we're getting a, a little bit closer to our what we want. And now I have a sum over all chi of um, 
well, let's write it like this chi x chi y bar, but then the whole lot has got a bar over the top. And that is uh, average over x, average over y, fx, gy bar, uh, sum over x. Now, chi is a character. This chi y bar is chi of minus y. And so we get chi of x minus y bar. And we're almost done. Actually, I meant to prove a lemma before this that evaluates a sum like this, but I'll do it now. So instead of stating to the lemma, I'll just say, but uh, sum over, sorry, that should be sum over chi there, very important. Um, actually, you can think of it like this. X minus Y is a character on the dual group. It's a, a homomorphism from the dual group to, to C. So you can sort of tell that this thing is going to be zero unless um, X minus Y is zero. And otherwise it will be, uh, all of these things will contribute one and we'll get the size of G. So we'll get, uh, uh, well, we'll come to that in a moment, but uh, but I'll I'll just in, I'll I'll stay I'll actually prove that in a slightly more formal way. So um, let's say if u doesn't equal zero, it'll be so. What I'm going to prove is going to be basically the same as the proof of orthogonality of characters. Um, then there exists some character psi such that uh, psi of u doesn't equal 1. Um, and uh, that's because otherwise psi of u would always be the same as psi of 0. Um, which would mean that the characters would lie inside a subspace of co-dimension 1, but they don't, they span. So um, we get the psi of u, there, there exists such a psi, and then the sum over all characters chi of chi of u equals the sum over all characters chi of uh, chi of u, psi of u, because chi psi, multiplication by psi, is a bijection from g, g bar to g bar, oh, sorry, g hat to g hat, uh, and since psi u doesn't equal 1, that tells us that the sum of chi u's equals 0. And if uh, u equals zero, then the sum over all chi of chi of u equals g hat bar uh, size of, which is the same as the size of g. So um, we get that uh, sum of chi over chi of chi x minus y even with the bar over the top, equals size of g if x equals y and naught otherwise. Now if we then look at the average over y, then the probability that x equals y is 1 over g, 1 over the size of g, and when it equals when x equals y, then we have a, a, a g of x bar here, which means that all this thing here equals average over x. So I've sort of taken out an f of x here, and now I'm looking at the average of y of g y bar times this function here, which I've just evaluated. Which, as I say, is going to be non-zero with probability 1 over g, which cancels out this size of g. 
Uh, and when it's non-zero, we get g bar of x. And uh, that's what we wanted. And so now let me just quickly define um, delta of u to be g if u equals 0, 0 if u doesn't equal 0. So this is a delta function in a sort of discrete way. It has the useful property, note that the integral, oh sorry, not the integral, expectation of uh, fx, uh, let's go for fy, delta x minus y, that's the expectation over y, equals f of x for any function f from g to c. So that's what we basically use. So this, this, where's it gone? Uh, this bit here was capital delta of x minus y. And so we got to, that's where the gx came from. Um, if we were working in a dual group, then it would be useful, and this sometimes happens, to define delta of u, but I won't call it u, I'll call it chi, equals just 1 if chi is the trivial character. I'm sort of denoting the trivial character by 0 because it's the identity in this abelian group, and 0 if chi does not equal 0. Or maybe for, maybe 0 is just a slightly confusing thing to write. So I'll write sort of chi 0, the trivial character that takes everything to 1. OK, now that notation will just smooth things a little bit uh, for the next proof, which is the inversion formula. So lemma. And just remember it said that f of x is the sum over all chi of f hat of chi uh, chi x. And again, let's just do some algebra. Sum over chi of f hat of chi chi x. We'll expand the Fourier transform and get average over, we can't use x because it's already been used, so we'll say f of y uh, chi of y bar, and then we have a chi of x, which is the average over y. You can see it's going to look rather similar in some ways to the previous proof. Sum over chi of chi of x minus y, because it's a character and chi of y is, chi y bar is chi of minus y, uh, which is average over y, f of x, delta of x minus y, uh, which equals, something's gone funny, that shouldn't have been an f of x, that should have been an f of y, there we go, uh, which equals f of x, as we hoped. <clears throat> right, now the property that's uh, really important and somehow makes this the Fourier transform rather than something else is the convolution law. Uh, I am keep rushing into things. Let's just first define what a convolution is. So definition, um, let g be a, fi I'll, I'll be fairly careful this time, let g be a finite abelian group. And let f and g be functions from g to the complex numbers. 
the convolution f star g of f and g is defined by the formula f star g of x is the average as you would expect because we're y plus z equals x of f of y g of z uh, I'll put this in brackets because we don't really tend to uh, use um, convolutions of functions to find on dual groups very much so if it, but nevertheless they, I think they do occasionally come up so if they're defined on a dual group g hat then we define it by using a sum instead uh, I have to say chi1 chi2 equals chi or something like that uh, f hat chi1 g hat chi2 now comes the lemma which if you've seen a bit of Fourier analysis you will be knowing what I'm going to say which is that uh, Fourier transforms take convolutions to pointwise products so let well, I've said, said all that let G be a finite abelian group up there so uh, if uh, F and G are maps from G to the complex numbers um, and chi is some character then f star g hat of chi equals f hat chi g hat chi and again this is a simple verification but uh, one way of thinking about this is it's extremely similar to the fact that if you multiply two polynomials together then the coefficient, so the, the multiplication of the polynomials you can think of either as um, just a pointwise product of two functions, the functions given by the polynomials, or you can say it's a sort of polynomial multiplication and the product is given by a new polynomial whose coefficients are convolutions of coefficients of the two original polynomials. And it's basically the same phenomenon going on here. Um, but we write it in a slightly different language. Um, so the proof is that uh, somehow it's always best to start with the side that needs more unraveling, so to speak. So f hat, f star g hat of chi is um, the average over x of f star g of x chi of x bar is the average over x average over y plus z equals x f of y g of z chi of well it's chi of x bar but now x equals y plus z so I can without changing anything I can write that as chi of y plus z and that equals average over x average over y plus z equals x f of y g of z chi of y is a, chi is a character so I can say chi of y chi, that should have been an a, a z there um, chi of z but with a bar on the top so bar bar but now we don't have any x's in here um, if I average over x and then I average over all y plus z equals x, if you think about it, I'm, every pair y plus z gives me an x, and if I just randomly pick y and z, then x will be uniformly distributed. So when I do all this, it's just the same as just taking the average over all y and z. In fact, um, I, feel, I think I'm just going to be a bit naughty here and replace that by the average over all y 
and z. But now if I just pick out the y parts and put them with the average over y and the z parts and put them with the average over z, you see that we've got precisely um, f hat chi, that's e y, f y, chi, y bar, and g hat chi, exactly as we wanted. So that's the convolution law. Um, and we are, so those are the big three, but um, there are a couple of other things that come in from time to time. So here's a little piece of notation. So if G is a finite abelian group, actually it doesn't have to be finite, but uh, for this definition, it doesn't even have to be abelian, but, uh, um, and n is a natural number, uh, then uh, one more thing, and g is an element of g, then let ng stand for g plus g plus n times. I think this is making g into a module or something like that. Um, and uh, also, if n is in z and n is less than zero, um, we can say that uh, ng equals minus minus ng, because that be a positive integer, and of course, zero g is is zero. Uh, so we can sort of multiply group elements by integers. The reason I said that it didn't even have to be abelian is I could have just written g to the n there instead of uh, what I did right. Um, in fact, it is just g to the n, but in an abelian group context. So I haven't really defined anything interesting. Um, I want to, perhaps I can just go straight into the lemma. So lemma dilation rule. So let G be a finite abelian group as always. Um, so let A in um, yeah, I think I can go for Z be such that um, the highest common, f I mean, A is co-prime to the size of G. And let B be a multiplicative, well, Uh, I didn't really need to state that there. In fact, I, I won't state it there. I'll state it in the proof. Um, no, I do want to... Uh, and... Yeah, okay, I will say that. Let a to the minus 1 be a multiplicative inverse of a mod g, mod size of g. Um, so, and let f be some function from g to c, and define the dilate, but I should have said all this definition stuff before the statement, um, f a from g to c by f a of x, equals f of a to the minus 1 x. Then f a hat of chi equals f hat of a chi, which is the sort of, you could take that a out and call it f f hat a to the minus 1 
of Kai if you want. And let's just, well, I'll start on this side. So FA hat of Kai is the average of FA of X Chi of X bar, which by definition is the average of X of F of A to the minus 1X Chi of X bar, which is the average over X. Now I'm going to change variables, but I'll still call it X. So my new X is A to the minus 1X, so I get an F of X. So I'm basically having to multiply everything by A, so that gives me Chi of AX bar, and that's exactly the definition of f hat of um, oh actually there's an extra step here which is average of x f of x chi of x bar to the a and that is precisely um, taking chi of x a times in the dual group uh, so now I can say that that, e that is the definition of um, f hat of a chi. Slightly confusing proof to look at because I'm sort of mixing uh, multiplicative no uh, notation here and additive notation here, but or additive looking notation. But that is unfortunately a, a, just an occupational hazard when you're dealing with dual groups because you think of them either as functions that you multiply pointwise or just elements of a slightly abstract abelian group which you add together. Um, so I had a similar problem earlier on when I was hesitating between calling the identity of the dual group either zero or the trivial character that takes a value one everywhere. Um, so there's a, that's another property, but there are also a couple of... Um, little observations to make. So why is Fourier analysis useful in additive combinatorics? I think the time has come to answer that question a little bit. And it's because uh, if you're given a subset A of an abelian group, a really important trick in combinatorics that's useful in a lot of places is to, it's a very simple idea, but uh, it's extremely powerful. It's to um, associate with A its characteristic function 1a. So it takes the value 1 for every x that belongs to a and 0 for everything that doesn't belong to a. So it's obviously a bijection between sets and characteristic functions. So you would think you're not gaining much by replacing a, or by replacing a set by its characteristic function. But one thing it allows you to do is to prove results about functions that are potentially more general than just zero one valued functions and then simply look at the zero one valued function case as the special case that you happen to be interested in at the end. So a lot of that goes on in additive combinatorics and uh, also in graph theory actually in parts of graph theory uh, as we'll see later on in fact. Um, so uh, that also one of the nice things about replacing the set by this function is that we can take the Fourier transform of the function and that turns out to tell you a lot about the set as and I'll give you an example of the sort of thing that you get out of it in just a moment um, but before I do that I want to just make um, a little observation which is if uh, a has density delta I'm not sure whether I've defined um, density, so let's just remind you, i.e. the size of A equals delta times the size of G. Then let's have a look at um, the L2 norm of 1A hat squared. So this is a, um, a function defined on the dual group, so I can take sums. So that's the sum over all chi of, uh, actually, I, I don't need to bother with that, but uh, I'm just going to apply Parseval. So we've got this. And what is that? Well, that's just by definition, the average over all x of 1a 
of x squared, but 1a is a 0, 1 valued function, so that's just the same as 1a of x. So this is where I rely on the function I'm talking about being 0, 1 valued. And if you think about that, that's just the probability that uh, x belongs to a, so that equals delta. But we also have something else, another way of getting... So the density we can interpret as the L2 norm of the Fourier transform of... I was about to say of A, strictly speaking of the characteristic function of A, but I identify these two so strongly in my mind that I actually think of this function here as being the Fourier transform of A, and I may even sometimes write it as A hat instead of um, 1A hat, and write things like A of X instead of 1A of X. But I'm being a little bit careful just here to start with. Uh, but also notice that, so I'll carry on being careful, so that 1a hat of uh, the trivial character, I better write it as the trivial character, uh, equals, well, the average over all x of 1a of x times the trivial character evaluated at x, which is just 1, so I don't have to write that down. So again, it equals delta. So we have another expression, a rather simpler one actually, it's just the Fourier coefficient at the trivial character. It gives you the density of the set A. And in general, if you've got a function, its Fourier coefficient at chi zero is just the average value of that function. Um, so as a last um, thing to show you uh, in this video, uh, I want to show you a typical example of a kind of concept that we've come across in additive combinatorics that has a Fourier interpretation. And that's the additive energy. Now, what I'm actually going to look at is the quantity. Uh, so we've got a set A. I'm going to look at the quantity x plus y equals z plus w of 1a x, 1a y. 1a z, 1a of w. Um, <clears throat> so what is that? Um, it's if I replace that by a sum, I would be summing over all additive quadruples when they belong when all four things belong to a of 1. In other words, I'd be counting the additive quadruples, which would give me the additive energy. So this thing equals, in fact, uh, I'm going to put it over here, it equals, um, but as it is, I'm, I'm not summing, I'm taking the average, and how, how many of these quadruples are there? There are the size of g cubed, so because I'm averaging over it, I have to put size of g to the minus 3 times the additive energy. So this is the additive energy, but just normalized by multiplying by g to the size of g to the minus 3. So it equals that. Now, what I claim is this has a very nice expression um, on the Fourier side. So we can interpret this as a Fourier type, as, as a sort of natural function of the Fourier transform of A. So the first thing to observe um, is that you've got the average... So if we just think about, um, perhaps I'll, actually I'm going to do this, normally I wouldn't need to do it in two steps, but I think it'll be just a bit clearer if I um, do it in two steps just because you might not be used to this, but uh, after a short time you don't have to do any sort of, um, this is an intermediate step that you could easily miss out because you would find it obvious, and I hope with a bit of practice, you will find it obvious that this expression is equal to the one I'm next going to write down. So, <clears throat> what is average over x plus y equals u, 1a x, 1a y? It's just a convolution of uh, 1a of x. Um, it's a convolution of 1a with itself evaluated at u. And this is also the convolution of 1a with itself evaluated at u, and I sum over all u, and so I'm taking the inner product, sorry, I average over u, so I'm taking the inner product of the convolution of 1a with itself with the convolution of 1a with itself. Um, 
which is the same as 1a star 1a L2 norm squared. But we can now use uh, Parseval's identity. Again, I'll do two steps where I would normally do one, actually. But uh, So it's equal to the L2 norm of the Fourier transform. But now we can apply the convolution law and say that that's equal to um, 1a hat squared L2 norm squared. Now if we expand out what that means, it's the sum over all chi of 1a hat of chi. And now I have to square it. And then I have to take the modulus squared. So I end up taking the modulus to the fourth. Um, and so that equals the L4 norm of 1a hat to the fourth. So apart from the normalizing factor g to the minus 3, the additive energy is just the L4 norm to the power 4 of the Fourier transform of the characteristic function of a. So that's one example of um, an additive concept. It's somehow because we can express it in terms of convolutions and inner products, we've got a nice Fourier expression on the other side. Um, and that will turn out to be very significant for a number of different arguments. But that is it for this video.